Pete Yost here for the Unbuild It podcast with a word about our sponsor, Huber Engineered Woods. There are really three reasons why I think Huber Engineered Woods stands out, and it's a big part of why they're a sponsor of our Unbuild It podcast. First, they develop systems of products. The products are compatible and integrated. Makes our jobs a lot more easy in the field and when specifying. Second is superior tech support. There are really good website resources that they have developed for the application of their products, but they also have an outstanding uh, 800 number tech team that really knows their stuff. And the last is a really active technical research and development team with whom I've done a lot of work over the years and I have a lot of faith in the information I get from them when I have questions about product performance. So that's it. That's our high performance sponsor. Now onto the podcast. Okay, for this group of builders roundtable discussion, Sashko was very kind and they're allowing us to use what is kind of their lobby conference room to record. Uh, we were all in De- in uh, Denver for the Building Science Symposium. Sashko said, we have a space. So if you hear audio problems with people in the background or manufacturing noises, this is on site. Give us a little credit. We're, we're, give us a little slack, I should say. Uh, we're trying to uh, uh, provide you some content, and we took the opportunity to record here today. So thank you, Sashko, for the space and your support of the podcast. I'm Jake Bruton, and welcome back to the Unbuild It podcast, another Builders Roundtable today. I'm joined by Jackson Andrews, Luke Mann, and Shane Durkin. And today, uh, I didn't tell these guys that we were going to talk about this, although we had previously discussed some of the things that we were going to talk about. We're going to talk about company structure, how you decide to grow or shrink, or how you decide to put what people on what projects and all the ins and outs. Uh, I think it might be easy to just say really quickly, like, how many people work for your company, Shane? Right now, it's just two. Two? Including myself. Okay. Three, including myself. Okay. 16. Okay. And we are somewhere between eight to 10, depending on what time of the year it is. Uh, we balloon a little bit with summer help. Sometimes uh, we were 11 over the summer, but we're back down to eight now. So there's variety here, right? Like Jackson, you're twice the size of me. I'm twice the size of Luke. Luke and Shane are, are smaller operations. Uh, how do we decide to get to that point? Like how, <laughs> how do you determine, let's start with a simple one. How do you determine whether or not you should hire someone. Not like, is this a good person, a good fit for our company? Whether or not you need to be putting an ad out to hire someone. Have any of us ever done an ad? I um, have not. I no. Have not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but like, that's a scary thing. And when I always talk about it, I always talk about like, I want this. I feel like I'm making a commitment to whoever's joining our team to basically support their family, right? Like, if you're going to quit your job and come work for us, that could be a real problem if I don't have work for you. That would be a real jerk move on my part to be like, yeah, I have this one job and that job's six weeks. We'll see what we get after that like, and not have planned ahead. So my like starting point is, do I have a year's worth of work for this person? If I have a year's worth of work for this person, then I probably can find something else before that year is up. But outside of that, like my parameters are very wishy-washy and very much based in like, I feel this way yeah. at this time. So what metrics do you guys use so that I can steal them and not have to do everything based off of feeling? <laughs> um, we feel a lot too. I have a very, very much of, you know, I think sometimes when things are working and you're like, this is great. I never thought I'd have, you know, a staff of 16. I can remember going up to like four or five being like, holy cow, this is a lot, no bigger. All of a sudden you're at eight than 10. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I don't think I've hired, I haven't actually sought out probably our last um, seven or eight um, hires. Um, a lot of times I get, you know, someone might reach out to me and, you know, are you hiring? No, I'm not. But, you know, what are you looking for? What are you interested in? And, um, I will not pass pass up the opportunity to possibly interview someone that could be a good fit for our team. Um, and I start with that because, you know, literally we've, we've grown a team of really exceptional 
um, you know, contractors that um, have all kind of dis- created from just an, an initial dis- discussion. And sometimes it's me not even realizing the need I have. Um, and and you know, I think our, our group works really well together to kind of constantly assessing how we're set up. Where are we lacking? You know, can we move people around in our team to a different spot? Could this person be a good candidate? But all that to say is it does come down to then the dollars and cents. I actually had the same timeline of like, I'm, I tell every employee, like I'm committing 100% for the next year. You are fully taken care of. Nothing you have to worry about. You know, and how I do that, in my mind, I've got a way to do that. You know, that we either have the work set up or we have a cash flow standpoint that we're in a good position that we can develop this role. Um, and so I make that commitment to, to anyone else we're hiring that, like, you know, you, nothing's going to, you know, for you to be gone in a year is, is your own doing, not 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 the company's. So Shane, with your with your crew, you and one other person, is that uh, is that like uh, oh, crap? I can't handle this on my own. I need somebody else to help me. Is that how it started? Uh, partly. I mean, I, I'm when I started building, I I kind of adopted this kind of one guy per project model. What I found to be most effective for me is if you have a guy that has the right skill sets to be the job site superintendent, so is like knowledgeable enough about the sticks and bricks, but has like executive level skill sets where they can communicate with clients and be a project manager and even be hands-on to self-perform like intermediate to advanced carpentry-related tasks at time, that that was like the most efficient way to get a project done, both from like a communication standpoint, but also from a standpoint of like eliminating obstacles to workflow, filling gaps in between trades. And that's effectively how I started. It was just me by myself building a house. Um, I got really lucky that like I opened my doors for business at the start of COVID when it was like someone poured gas on a fire and all of these opportunities came to me very fast and it was kind of just like, I need to rise to the occasion and take these on and I'll bring on help to staff up appropriately. Like, um, so for the first couple of years of business, I was effectively like project managing all the projects, but I brought on help to support and they were kind of in a supporting role. I've now, since I'm shifting and transitioning into a business model where like I will only run and project manage one project and the other two that I have are staffed out to a project manager. And when I say project manager, that person effectively is their own builder, but they have you know guidance and mentorship for myself, but they perform every function of building that house almost as if they had their own license and they were doing it on their own. And that's just the business model that works for me. I think it's a function of the geography too. Like all of my operations are so tightly compacted. All of my job sites are within a quarter mile of one another. And so to not be geographically stratified means that like for the first couple of years of business, I could take on more volume than I otherwise could if all four projects were spread out across yeah, you could see 25 miles. In four hours totally. Of totally. Um, so I, I've effectively been kind of like in a sprint though. Like I definitely brought more work on than I can handle and was just like, I need to kind of rise to the occasion to get the business established. And over the course of the past couple of years, I've just been vetting the right guys to bring on to get into a more steady state, stable business model, which for me is three projects with one, like a one-to-one ratio. For however many projects I have, I have to have that level of manning in the business. And if I'm going to add that fourth project, a project manager comes along with it. The only person I'm also thinking about bringing on would be kind of like a lead carpenter, someone who can kind of float between the entire enterprise and assist. Um, The economics of doing that in California can be somewhat punitive because lower wage classifications come with very high workers' comp expense that it's almost, you know, preferable to subcontract that out to like a 1099. But it's also, I've got enough volume of the business that I kind of need to have that capacity in-house. So that's that's something that I'm juggling with. But for the most part, like my decision to bring an employee on is like trying to more or less maintain this ratio of personnel to number of projects, if that okay. makes sense. Luke, do you find that there is, that that one-to-one model is the right way to do it? Because you run differently, like yep. you're one to two or three potentially, yep. but then you have support for all three, that's right? right. So it's myself, site supervisor, and I have a controller or office manager. He runs all the books and everything. It's actually my dad. 
Um, so he's running all the financials, and that was a couple of years ago. I offloaded all the financial burden to him, and it's been a, it's yeah. a time saver, huge time saver. And he just runs everything so tight, which is great. So that offloaded a bunch of time for myself. Um, and then I have a site supervisor, and we just share responsibility. Uh, the two of us that are out in the field every day, um, I could say I'm not in the office as much as I used to be. Um, looking for, though, taking that next step and hiring a project manager um, here in the future. I'm not in a rush to do that right now. Um, and the shared responsibility is what I have found being really successful. I love to have my eyes, my ear, like everything. I love to have my bot, like self on the jobs on a daily basis. And I'm okay with that. Like I'm never, I'm not aspiring to have a team of, you know, eight to 10 to 15 people. Um, we're keeping it small. So I think I've come to the conclusion that all businesses somewhere around the four to five to six employee range. It then goes from what you guys are talking about, where you're on site every day, to there starts to be a point where you you cannot be on site and run a successful business at the same time. I agree. Like yeah. once you get to that four or five employee range, you have to be working, as they always say, working on the business rather than in the business. You have to be developing procedures for everything. You have to be developing what the company looks like and how it's supposed to run rather than just it's me and another guy and we can figure this out. Like, so is that a transition? I mean, you kind of just said that's probably not a transition that you're interested in right now. Not right now. No. Um, Shane, yeah, is that a for me, not not right now either. <laughs> like, I, I really like being involved. Like, I, I don't think I want to get to the point where I'm willing to relinquish the responsibility of at least project managing one project. Um, I've just found that, like, it allows me to, and, you know, I'm, I'm also at a point, it's a personal choice where I've got the business to a point where I'm earning enough income and I'm, like, proud of the, the, the living I'm able to create for myself. I could, you know, continue to try and grow to make more, but I, I just like being hands-on. I still wear my tool belt, like, multiple times a week because I enjoy it. It's not something I'm willing to give up yet. And I'm also still just like on a mission to constantly continue like improving my craft to the point that I don't want to say it's like, all right, we've, we've figured it out. We can stop innovating and improving, but I don't know. I feel, I feel like I'm able to accelerate that, that type of growth by being still at the tactical level, if that makes sense. Um, so for me, I like at least being, uh, you know, plugged into the business where I still have a project to run, but you know, it's not enough. I'm just being perfectly honest to like fill my entire day and week, just one project. That's where like the other two, if I have project managers on, I still have enough bandwidth and freedom to be able to oversee them mm -hmm. and staff them. Um, you know, it's, it's a trade-off. I feel like there's this jumping off point where and it comes down to honestly like personal finances, but to make the amount of money that I'm able to carve out for myself now while running one project, I actually have to jump to like five or six, you know, yeah. to basically be able to carve out enough projects from each one of those, enough profit from each one of those yeah. projects to equate to the same amount I'm making as a project manager. Sure. And so that's really like the, the point for me. Once I go beyond this, it's like, then I kind of really have to go for it. Otherwise, I'm almost taking concession and personal income and time spent in the business, if that makes sense. Well, and you're only a few years in, mm -hmm. like there's absolutely no reason that, that that's not the, the, a perfectly great business model. Like totally. I'm seeing everything. I'm in charge of everything. Totally. I'm on every job site every day. Right. I'm going to keep this from getting screwed up. Whereas if you look at uh, my business model or, or kind of almost Jackson's business model as well, like I'm here, my phone has not rang for work since I left the office. It won't ring this week. It might ring once for work. Uh, I'm way more likely to get a phone call from a subcontractor that then is just a respond text with like, call your project manager, don't mm -hmm. call me. Mm -hmm. Because we've set it up so that it's not my responsibility and it's given us the opportunity, I think, for us to actually produce higher quality work because we have my oversight at a 50,000 foot level and I'm kind of salesperson and specifications and the project managers are spending all day there where 
once you take me out of the equation, I'm doing the exact same thing that you two mm -hmm. are talking about. It's just the project managers are doing it instead of I am. Mm -hmm. And I think that Jackson's kind of the same way. We've been lucky enough to hire a team that handles it without us being there. And I always tell clients, like, straightforward up front, like, I'm not the person that's going to build your house. My team is going to build your house, mm -hmm. and they are better at this than I am mm -hmm. because I do other things now. That's been a really hard challenge, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure how we got here. Like, it just, it happened right. over over a period of time. Uh, and I'm lucky with the team that I have that it, that it works. Uh, I'm interested to hear, Jackson, how you decide, because you have a project manager and an assistant project manager, or project manager and some yeah. carpentry staff, yeah. and they move around from job to job. How do you determine who's going to get which project? Mm -hmm. If this is something that you want your employees to ever hear. <laughs> I like who's going to take which job yeah. and... Uh, like how their team gets built to them? Yeah, um, gosh, those are good questions. I think the first and foremost, I'd start with schedule. So we will not start a project unless we have a manager available to take that on. So even as we're taking jobs into pre-con or if I'm interviewing a client, and then, you know, we're discussing taking on a project, schedule is something we talk about really early on. When are you looking to do this project? It's like, we want to start in the next three months. It's like, well, I just can't, I can't do it. I don't have anyone available. You know, our jobs are not going to be wrapping up. And the next available, you know, project manager I would have is this person and it'd be about, about this time. So we're always, we do look at schedule. There also is, you know, I'll say one thing we try to keep very consistent. Everyone's different. Everyone's just kind of wired differently. They, you know, interact differently. And I mean, my managers are very much like that. They're all different. The one thing we try to keep very consistent, though, is our culture in our company, how we speak to our trades, how we speak to our clients, you know, and, and each other. So that culture has to be consistent, That which gives me a lot of confidence of how I place my managers, knowing that this person is going to rub this person the wrong way, a client the wrong way. I don't have to worry about that. But there is definitely a level of, you know, I do have a range of some project managers because we do, we do a range of projects, you know, and some might be much more, uh, have a lot more technical, you know, execution needed, you know, or a lot uh, more um, lower tolerances for if it's more modern architecture, for example, that I've got um, some guys that are really experienced in that. But at the same time, um, well, so and that's kind of how I, I do. I look at the scope of work and I also look at our schedule. There are some clients that I'd, you know, that we have projects that say it needs this project manager or one of these two or three. They're not available for the next 12 months. So I, unfortunately, I can't take this on. Um, that's, I'm, you know, that's kind so of extreme. are you saying it probably is strength first? Like you're going to look at the project and go, this yeah. is definitely one yeah. that this project manager would be the greatest opportunity for success. Yeah. That but, means unless you're willing to wait until their current job's over. Yeah. But that's also, that's going to be a pretty, a, in order for me to say that, that means this is a really exceptional scope of work that has extremely high levels of execution that are needed. Our project managers are, they're all, I mean, I don't hesitate to put any of them on you know, most of our projects. So schedule is a big thing, but if there is one that is going to be, um, you know, the one we've had that was wrapping up the modern build for us, like that, that is a Rick Mills job. You know, I've got some other project managers that I think with Rick's oversight as well can execute that. Um, but, you know, so, so I do, I do look at, you know, I do look at skill level um, for sure, but that is a, I think our, our managers are pretty well, they're all really good at what they do. Um, I, the biggest thing is about luck and who we hire I, I love the fact that I get to tell all of my clients or anyone that we're interviewing in the beginning and say, look, here's the coolest thing about my company and my opinion is my staff is primarily all of my project managers have had their own businesses and been their own contractors at one point in time. I am honored. They can and they have done this on their own. I'm honored that they want to do this and they, they see the value in a team collaboration and they want to do this under an umbrella with a group of people rather than off on their own. So like I, I put a lot of confidence in our managers very upfront. And there are a lot of guys who have been doing this longer than I am that I have that are on my team. So there's a lot of value that in strength I'm able to go ahead and like, you know, confidently tell a client that this is what you're going to be getting out of our managers. Um, that's a really long answer. I can drive into our yes, assistant project manager or I can wait and let some other people <laughs> no, go. No, so sorry. go ahead. So I do have assistant project managers. Um, and, and how those guys are really, you know, allocated to jobs, it's, they, they kind of roam and they rotate. And I have a production manager that, you know, he has kind of been, you know, become a huge asset for me. Uh, we took one of our project managers and put him in a production role to where he is a first line of defense for all of our project managers. And then he dictates where all the assistants go every single day. 
Um, so depending on the need, you know, that he will dictate where those guys go and what they're doing. So your assistant project managers are not tied to a single project. No, they're kind they're, of floating. We, a lot of times what has tend to happen over the last 18 months, they kind of get tied to an area more or less. Cause again, we, we do work in a small radius, multiple neighborhoods, Jake, but a small, sure. you know, little, little radius that we work with in Virginia you. beach. Um, and so we might have, you know, some guys are doing, we have a couple of managers in this side of town doing these projects and ones over here. So just to keep people close by, and then they're also familiar with the more familiar with those projects. So they do roam, but they also, I mean, again, we're only doing six or seven jobs at a time. Um, so, you know, we split our project we have four project assistant project managers that we kind of split up for the most part. So you guys both as business owners were just a one man show at one point, kind of, or lesser people. So, um, can I ask just for my own clarification and like building a business, when do you make that step and when did you decide to go bigger? Because at some point you're relinquishing control, right? Um, And do you think that's a a learned thing to be able to do or do you think it's a personality thing or like Shane, I'll ask you too, like, do you ever think you'll be able to relinquish that control, you know, of your product? Um, Because for me, I mean, I don't want to use the term control freak, but I'm, I, don't, I don't consider myself a control freak. But at the same time, like, I would consider I really, you yeah. a control yeah. freak. I think we probably all are. No. <laughs> I mean, we have our, we, we, we built our own companies. You've got to have control. Yeah. Brand sure. But, so then so I guess I'm asking, where we yeah, are. Like, yeah. well, like Jake, what, you, for me, I know I've got enough work that can come in that I can, you know, could take on more work and grow the business. Um, but yeah, like, how do you so, navigate that? For the longest time, we had more work than what we could get done. We all, we've had a waiting list for a really long time. We grew for a while when I had some team members that I really thought could handle it. We learned lessons about that they really couldn't handle it. Like I just had really, really great carpenters, not good managers. Uh, and so we scaled back down. And this version, this round of growth has kind of been completely driven by the fact that we have a team in place that can those guys by the way, we always say guys. Everybody sitting sure. around this table has said guys. Sure. I've only ever had one female field employee. Uh, it, it is guys. The people that apply for jobs to work with us are guys. So sorry if it's wrong that we're just using the term guys. The folks. Any, <laughs> that, anyone can apply. Yeah. yeah. The folks that we have had work with us recently, we've, over the last few years, we've had a team that, like, they, just like Jackson was saying, all of them could be in business for themselves probably. Yeah. If they had the sales side down or the business acumen, they could be in, They can totally do this without me. We have operations in Kansas City. You've met Isaac. You're friends with Isaac. He doesn't need me. Right yeah, he is, <laughs> he is playing disc golf with your kids. Uh, Great guy, he, by the way. He does not need me except for the sales process. Like He might not agree with that, but he totally could do this without me if he wanted to. That's what makes it possible for me to have a team in place that does it without me for the most part. So you have clients that you're wanting them to put their trust into you. You're doing the same thing with your guys and and your PMs. You're able to pull back because you trust them unconditionally. Yeah. I mean, with the Pretty much. I'm going to be gone for four days and I'm probably not going to check in. Yeah. That's great. And it doesn't go perfect. No. Stuff's going to get screwed up. It absolutely is going to get screwed up. Uh, I had a project manager the other day make a mistake, and he said, 10 years ago with this, like, I, I said, okay, well, this is what happened. He's like, yep, I agree. I said, this is the result. He's like, yep, I agree. And I was like, and this is the cost of the company. And he's like, yep. Yeah. And he's like, 10 years ago, would this have been a calm conversation? <laughs> and I was just like, absolutely not. I would have been heated. I would have been angry. I would have been like, there's no way we can afford to do this. But instead, it's like that's a minor cost in the grand scheme of things of that mistake won't ever happen again. Like right. there, it took a lot of growth to get to this point and it took the right team. And very quickly, if you were like, oh, I'm going to swap you with three other project managers, I'd be like, okay, well, I can't travel or I can't do any build show content. I, I can't do the podcast. I need to focus on being there every day. Yeah. So, yeah, for me, it's entirely team based. I think for me, the. I've learned one, I've always hired one at a time, yeah. which has been, I think a, a really good, um, I'm glad I haven't had to learn the lesson the other way, but I've had time to the first, my first hire is still with me. He's our senior project manager, uh, Rick Mills. He is an incredible at what he does. Yeah. And, um, 
but I've been able to invest. In, and I think Rick would say, I've heard him say, you know, like how he communicates, how he thinks. It's different than when he started working with me. I mean, so I, I think he's learned a lot from me. He's learned how I communicate. He's learned how my mind ticks, what's important to me, whether it's, you know, from a customer service side and execution side, um, the deliverables that we're, we're trying to, you know, um, to make. Um, he, he understands it 100%. Um, my next hire uh, was uh, Chris Turnus, who is our designer, but also does a lot more than that just on the office side with me as well. He also knows how I can, how, he knows, they know what I'm going to do. My production manager, Jeff Britton, knows exactly my response to any problem that's going to come up. So I'm able, I've learned the more I actually delegate out, the better our team come, becomes. Um, I struggle with that for a while because it's like, man, the more people I bring in, it's to do my job and the better we are. Like, wait, what am I doing? Where's my value? Um, and and I, I still, I believe I have value. But even though, like Jake said, like, we so can remove ourselves. Say what that value you still I'm have. St- <laughs> he just said, I certainly Chance. still have. My wife value. says I'm still important. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> my mom says the same thing. And, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, there is a, I think the ability to, to train your team to, to think like you do. So I think it'd be, it would, I think that's the, I think for me, that's been the, the main successful, you know, how we've been able to do this successfully is that I'm able to know that this person will not only hold the fort down, but they will respond how I would. I mean, I literally, it, it is, you know, if I came back and someone said, hey, we let so-and-so go, or we got rid of this trade, I would say, okay. Like the fact that you did it means it really got bad. You know, I probably would have done it much sooner, you know? So like they, but you've got to, I think it'd be, I think that would be a really big struggle. Or so I'm, I'm hinting at like, how do you, someone that likes control, it's your brand, you've built it. Sure. How do you like let that go? I don't think you can actually let go of that ever, but you can learn to be a little bit more open palmed with it once you know that someone's going to respond the way you do. That transition that you made, because I imagine at one point you were both project managers. Yeah. Yep. That transition to your business shifting to a format where you no longer become a project manager. When was that last project that you ran? And like, what was, like, how, how big did the business look at that point? What was your volume like? Do you remember where, what you looked like when you made that transition, when you made that jump to say, I'm now going to be overseeing the whole enterprise with a layer underneath me? Uh, yeah, we really just went from like, I was project managing two jobs and I had an assistant helping to just being like, okay, these are going to be your problem now and we're going to find some other people and we're going to continue our growth here. But this is your problem and I cannot be on job every day. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, there's too much there's too much other stuff that has to do with their old building for me to be on jobs for eight hours a day. I have to be able to attend to the other stuff. And it was literally just the project manager was like, okay. So it was pretty early then in yeah. the growth of the company. I mean, if you were making yeah. that decision Year at five. project number two, three, yeah. I'm not saying it was your second project, but like that's the level of volume you were at when you made that switch. Yeah. yeah. It was later for me. It was probably year... And we're in 11 now, so probably three, four years ago, four years ago, um, did I really realize, like, I can't manage a job. Um, probably wasn't more until, like, two years ago that I realized, like, I can't be involved at all with the management of a, of a project. Because if I'm putting time into being on site full time to run, run a project, there's so much other stuff that I'm not getting to and, and doing that's important for the livelihood of our team. And so I, like my production manager, like my knows, like I have good intentions and I'll be like, Hey, so-and-so is going to be out of town next week. Oh, I'll cover for him. I'll manage it. And they're like, hell no, that's not happening. Like you can't manage. You don't have time. Yeah, I don't. And, and I, I managed my own um, renovation that we did personally. It didn't get done, you know? <laughs> so uh, we brought, you know, we had a, we had a break and I've got one of our managers over there. I just said to my wife said, you're going to work with Zach. I'm out of here. Like, this is never going to get done. And it's going to be better for our marriage if I get you a project manager at this point. And so that's what we, you know, like, I, I can't manage a job at this point because how we manage and what a client's expecting, if I'm doing that role, then I'm not delivering, I'm not delivering what we promise. Sure. Yeah. Can I ask if you, so as you grow, you also have to hit a bottom line. You have to hit a number. And so as you're growing, there's projects coming in and you see these projects coming in that you may not want to take on, but you know they're going to help with that bottom line to pay your support and your staff that you feel responsible for. Have you ever encountered, you know, or, you know, have you encountered a project where you're like, man, I really don't want to take this on, but we're going to have to. So that we got to, 
we can cover the cost and the salary of all. Not once. Really? Seriously, not once. I've never looked at it that way. My uh, business acumen must be garbage because I never look at the <laughs> bottom line. I always have a we'll figure it out mentality. Sure. Like that, I think that's part of what makes me successful is I'm like, yeah, how hard can it be? Other people do it. So they're, they're just people. I'm just a person. Uh, I'm, I've done a really good job, I feel like, of saying like, this is not for us. This is not what we need to do. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Like, yeah. I also have had some very fortuitous quits. <laughs> like I've had some people quit at a moment where it was like, if they would have waited three weeks later, they would have gotten laid off. <laughs> like they quit, and it just and it it happened like three or four different times. Like I had two guys quit as a job was finishing up, and it was just like, oh well, we were going to sit down and talk tomorrow about how I don't have anything, and I'm going to have to let them go. Mm. I guess that's a great thing that they quit. Yeah, sure. I wish I could say I've had. I've had to be in that situation because I think there's a lot of wisdom that comes through having gone through that stuff. And there's without, um, but I haven't either. I have not been in that position where, you know, crap, we have, you know, we don't, we're not, there's not enough income for what we, what our overhead and what our staff needs. Um, but I think part of that, going back to like, what's my value? Sure. You know, I lose sleep at night. I mean, like, it, it is, it's the importance of like knowing that I, we have a team that I have to, I have to deliver. They're not out there looking for, for the projects. My, my job is to make sure we get more work coming in and that it's with clients that I am telling my project managers, this person's going to be fun to work with. I'm not throwing you into the, you know, a, a ringer on this one. Sure. And so, yeah, I lose a lot of, you know, there's a lot of stress, as we all know, of like, crap, the phone's not ringing at the moment. Um, all right, if one doesn't come in. So I, I look, I project very far down the line is what I've started doing because we have a bigger staff. I have to yeah. be thinking, all right, we are solid, you know, the idea of like, yeah, we're, we're booked for the next 12 months. It's great and it sounds great, but it's also like, all right, what about in 13, like in 14? Like I've got to be, to keep this many guys busy, I've got to be cranking in the next 12 months, you know, the next six months to get things in pre-con and in design so that they are actually ready to start. Right. So, um, yeah, there, it's a, I haven't been in that position. I t I've told, I tell myself I will never let someone go because we can't, uh, can't afford them. There's always a way to find something. And I have, when I've hired people, and I've hired, like I said, the last seven or eight people I've hired, I wasn't in the market for a new employee, but I've interviewed them. I've met them. I'm like, y'all would, would be a huge value to us. Like come, let's, let's design a role. And I've, and all those employees I've said, look, and I am making the commitment. I'm good for a year. I can support this and what your, what the expense is going to be. Um, what I can't promise you is after that, but I can promise you that we will find a way if you're willing to be versatile with us as well. Meaning like, hey, if you're okay and you wrap up this amazing whatever million dollar home and you're okay with the next week, it's like we don't have anything started, but you can put a belt on and help, you know, drill over here. Frame, and if you have that attitude, then there's always a spot for you. I was just going to piggyback on that. Like, I think maybe one of the variables in the equation of what the right level of staffing is in your company is how you tackle your projects. Like, are you vertically integrated at all to the point that you are self-performing work? Me and my business, I'm not. I'm primarily providing what I say, professional construction management services. We are project managers, but at the core, I got to make sure every guy I'm bringing on is also a craftsman yeah. and has the capability to execute intermediate to advanced carpentry related tasks. Cause I've always thought that like, if you needed to, have a business move through business cycles, you could very easily become vertically integrated and begin to self-perform work and charge for it as a way to make up with a rapid decline in volume. Yeah, you know? For sure. yeah. So I would wrap this conversation by saying, number one, we were both single people yeah. at one point. Number two, I absolutely felt the way Shane and, and Luke felt at some point. Like, I'm never going to be the person that's hands off. I'm never going to be a, yeah. a keyboard contractor. I'm never going to be the person that's not on site. And when it happened, it was very much the right thing to do. And it was um, very clear that it was the right thing to do. And I don't know exactly what point that was, but it feels like, especially looking back now, like I know that we've made all the right choices over the last five years to get to where we are. Uh, so I would say be open to figuring it out as you go. Yeah. Making mistakes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah working with again. people, man. <laughs> yeah. People. I know. People, yeah. And, and that's probably something else, too, that is, you know, I feel like I'm constrained by the talent I'm able to bring on. I set a very sure. high threshold. And it's like there are projects out there I would love to take on, 
I just can't scale the resources and grow the resources with it. Like I just can't find the right project managers for it. And that's just a, a factor of the market I'm in might be the same for. I think it's so wise to pass on it rather than try to take something that needs a person like that and you don't have that person lined up. It could be a disaster having the wrong person in it. So if we didn't have clients and we didn't have customers, would this not be the best job in the history of the world? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think know. it's pretty We're great. Talking about it. Sometimes the right client is what makes it worth it. Yeah, makes it exactly. Worth it, you know, exactly. It's like, you know, I would maybe prefer to be building for a client in that instance as opposed to just being like a spec development. Yeah, you know, you gain wisdom and knowledge and education from the right client. In a lot of in a lot of examples. So. Absolutely, gentlemen. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for watching the Unbuild It podcast today or listening to the Unbuild It podcast. If you're watching, don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Uh, the your subscribing and your liking drives traffic to the YouTube channel. It helps with growth. And if you are just listening through whatever platform, make sure you leave us a five-star review. And uh, until next time, have a good day.